as in the past, uh, like 20 years, maybe le just a little bit less than 20 yeah. years. But since so many, many years, uh, Professor Emilio Mordini, who is not an engineer, he is not a physicist, he is not a computer scientist, he is not a data scientist, he is a medical doctor, and to be pres more precise, he is a psychiatrist, right? Correct. So what does, what does it come, uh, how does it come a psychiatrist in uh, a biometrics uh, technological school? Well, because Professor Mordini is also an expert in bioethics. And as we have had a chance to discuss many times in this 20th edition of the school, ethical issues are of paramount importance in, in biometric applications. Even the lecture before this one, Professor King pointed out uh, and showed several uh, uh, results regarding the bias in biometric system, in automated system. So uh, this lecture is as the last because it allows you also to reflect and meditate more on all the information that you captured during the week. And probably- Possiamo evitare di avere la schermata laterale? Perché no, probably, taglia le, le diapositive. Also, uh, consider what you have learned now under a different point of view. Huh? So it is my pleasure to introduce you, Professor Emilio Mordini. Now, over to you. Thank you, Massimo. It's working, yes. So good afternoon to everybody. Yes, I am a psychiatrist uh, and uh, an amateur philosopher as well, in the sense that I have a degree in philosophy as well, but I don't, uh, I'm not a professional philosopher, but I've been involved in the biometric uh, ethics since the beginning. Uh, in Europe, uh, I was probably the first who uh, opened this field uh, in 2003. Uh, we organized uh, a large uh, international research project uh, uh, on biometric ethics. Uh, and then followed by two other large projects uh, with conferences uh, with Professor Testarelli as well in India and in China and the United States. So it was a large uh, 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 movement uh, of uh, people and thoughts. Huh? But uh, mm, so my interest is uh, in the human uh, aspects of biometrics, ethics, of course, not only ethics, the societal impact, the way in which uh, people perceive this technology. And uh, each year uh, when I participate in uh, the school, uh, the summer school, international summer school, I. Uh, search to identify the hot topic of the moment. And the hot topic uh, today is probably uh, uh, artificial intelligence and ethics of artificial intelligence. So this presentation is as partly be funded by a research project uh, uh, sponsored by the European Commission. Now that I have thank the European Commission, I can start to criticize it. Um, biometrics, algorithm, and ethics. Uh, I don't uh, think uh, to need uh, to explain you what is biometrics, what is, uh, what algorithms are, but, uh, Maybe um, it, is, uh, it makes sense to spend a couple of words about uh, ethics. The way in which we use the word ethics today, in English above all, but almost as far as I know, in Italian, in French, in German, it's used as well 
it means something good. Huh? It is ethical to do this. It is morally right. This is a wrong usage of this term. Because ethics, rigorously, rigorously speaking, means any theory, any doctrine, any point of view of human action, in the broadest sense of action. I, I include in action even thoughts, uh, decisions, uh, not only behavior, uh, action, any human activity uh, considered according to main variables, good and bad. This is ethics. If I consider human action according to other categories, beauty and ugly, this is aesthetic. It's another, another matter. But ethics is, I consider human actions, human life according to variables, to criteria, good and bad. The main point of ethics is first, two, two main points. The first is, you can avoid ethics. Whether either you are aware of this, of it, or you are unaware. Because human beings always make an assessment, judgment about what is bad, what is good, even if they are not aware of this. Is in 40 years, I'm, uh, I've been working as a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. I've never met a human being uh, who did not use the categories of good and bad. Of course, the category of good and bad can be very nuanced and very difficult to define. but cannot be avoided. Those who say, I'm not interested in ethics. It is not something which concerns my life, are hypocritical, or at least are unaware of themselves because they use everything they do. They take a decision, they make a decision. And when they make a decision, they decide that something is better and something is worse. And according to certain criteria, even if I am completely selfish, I decide that I don't care of other people. I think that altruism is a stupid thing. Perfect. This is ethics, again, because this is a perspective. Your perspective is that selfishness, individual gain, is the good thing, while altruism is the bad thing. You can find this kind of uh, ethics unacceptable, but it is still ethics. So in any case, you have an ethics. Those who claim that they do not have an ethics, they only follow uh, unawarely, without being cautioned of this, they follow the ethics of the majority or the society, the, the place where they live. The second concept, which is extremely important for engineers, because of engineers are often confronted with uh, ethics when they submit a research project or their experiment, etc. Uh, a typical uh, confusion in between ethics and law. There are two different things. Law does not concern what is good and what is bad. Law concerns what is allowed and what is prohibited. But there is a certain overlap, usually in almost all society, one tends to have a law which is not 
too far from ethics. But for instance, mm. yesterday, my driving license expired. True. And I can renew it only on Monday. So for a couple of days during this weekend, I cannot drive. If I drive, the police uh, stop me and check my documents, driving with, uh, without a, driving, a valid driving license, it's a legal offense. It is a moral offense? No, because I don't risk other people's lives because I'm driving exactly yesterday, today, the same way. If I risk it, uh, other people's life, I could do this uh, even with the driving license. So from a legal point of view, I'm punishable. From a moral point of view, I'm not punishable. I'm not punishable. I'm not uh, uh, deplorable. Most things done during the Nazi period in Germany were legal, were according to the current legislation. If you worked in an extermination camp, you could kill Jewish, uh, Roms, uh, Jehovah witnesses, uh, uh, homosexual, respecting the law. If you refused to kill them and you were employed in an extermination camp, you were punishable by law. So you see, there are very extreme situations. The driving license, which is a very stupid, very trivial situation, even till to very dramatic, very tragic uh, uh, situation like the extermination camp I mentioned. So ethics and law are two different things. Don't confuse them. Ethics is unavoidable, first concept. Second concept, ethics uh, is different from law. And now we start uh, speaking of law, in particular of uh, uh, an initiative of the European Parliament, which started in June 2021, when uh, the Parliament asked for a permanent ban of uh, automated recognition of individual, individuals in public spaces and uh, banning uh, predictive policy based on behavioral data. How many of you are familiar with uh, uh, the European system of governance? Is anyone who is familiar with? Raise uh, his hand. Professor Tistarelli, <laughs> <laughs> the two victims like me of the European governance. The European governance is a very bizarre thing. Um, there are three bodies. The European Parliament, uh, uh, which is elected by European citizens. This is the easier. Then there is uh, the European Commission, which is the government, but it is not elected, is appointed by uh, national governments. And then there is the European Council, which is the committees of prime ministers. So a legislation to be enforced the, the European Parliament can enact a legislation. Now, the legislation can be enforced only after reaching an agreement among these three institutions. So now I will tell you what is the current situation with this issue with the Parliament, but doesn't mean that it will be a real law when uh, uh, will be enforced. Because I repeat, it is uh, the, the three bodies must reach an agreement, and uh, there are some difficulties in this. Because last month, uh, the two committees, the joint 
a commission of the two committees of the parliament, the market committee and the civil liberties committee, uh, took uh, and, uh, made this uh, statement uh, about the ethics of uh, artificial intelligence. I repeat, this is now a legislation which need to be uh, to be approved by the two other bodies. Mm -hmm. But it is the basis, it is a starting point. And there are some things which are banned. And you could probably immediately sniff the odor of biometrics because most things here concern biometrics. Real-time remote biometric identification systems are banned. Post remote biometric identification systems banned. Biometric categorization systems using sensitive characteristics, soft biometrics in practice, banned. Uh, predictive policing systems. Emotional recognition systems, again, biometrics. And uh, uh, indiscrimination scraping of biometric data from social media or CCTV, etc. So all these activities, according to the European Parliament, should be banned in Europe. It means that you cannot do research on this. You can, you can, it is something, it is a criminal offense, okay? And in this case, it is a criminal offense which has been decided on the basis of an ethical reasoning. And the ethical reasoning is that all these things are retreated, they treat, uh, are retreated, they treat uh, fundamental rights of the European Union, fundamental uh, human rights, which are the basis of the Union. And uh, uh, so this, when you say it's banned, is it only automatic characterization that is banned or even manual use? Uh, no, uh, automatic. And in the, uh, um, the key point is uh, algorithm, is artificial intelligence. In principle, if you use uh, uh, if you recognize faces on the basis uh, of uh, uh, CCTV recorded uh, CCTV, and there is an expert, uh, uh, police expert who recognizes faces, is not uh, is not uh, prohibited. It is a standard practice, but you can tell a computer who does it for you. And you can see that the, the, the focus is on a specific technology, which is the, the most important technology affected by, by this uh, uh, legislation, which is facial recognition technology. And you know better than me, you are engineers, I think most of you, or all of you, so you know that uh, today, facial recognition technology is quite different from old-fashioned face biometrics. It is, a, it is a, one of the greatest innovation in the last decade. We now use face prints, which is a, a different concept uh, from the all the biometrics, modal points that are used to measure different variables. And uh, all uh, these systems works thanks to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the enabling technology behind facial recognition technology. 
So the focus is on artificial intelligence. And it was not by case, it was not uh, something, uh, an aspect that, that this kind of legislation is within a larger legislation on artificial intelligence. And this is a list of the main 12 applications allowed by uh, FRT today. They range from uh, uh, face detection and arrive till automating lip reading. Uh, it's a long list. And you see that the, the, the green boxes means that artificial intelligence uh, are is used to uh, implement the technology. And you see that all this technology, face detection, face tracking, face, facial landmark extraction, face spoofing detect detection, they use artificial intelligence. Face identification, face verification, kingship verification. Facial expression recognition, action unit detection, automatic lip reading, facial attribute estimation, facial attribute manipulation. All these applications are based on artificial intelligence and they are somehow banned or limited, very strictly limited, cannot be used for uh, forensic purposes cannot use uh, uh, for legal purposes. Cannot use in immigration. Cannot be used in immigration control, in border control, etc. Most applications. It remains you can use this kind of application only in a supermarket to detect your consumer behavior and preferences. This is still allowed, but apart from a few cases like this, you cannot use, you cannot study even these applications. So the problem is what is called ethics of algorithms. I told you that ethics concern human action. So in principle, should not concern mechanical devices. Can a mechanical device act? No, it can't. Act at least in the sense to make a decision and follow the decision with an action. No, in certain sense. In another sense, yes. So there are two uh, points behind the idea of ethics of algorithm. The most obvious one, which is, uh, uh, the point uh, was, uh, okay. Okay. The most obvious one is that algorithms influence our decision. This is obvious. Even sometimes, Today, more and more often, they make decision on our behalf. So in, in, in such a sense, there is ethics of algorithms, but also in the sense that uh, algorithm could include, embody some ethical assumption. And this is, the, the aspect which concern you more directly as engineers. The first way in which algorithm can embed values is in the design. And there are two main approach to this uh, uh, problem. One is called 
disclosive ethics and the other value sensitive design these two approaches are both uh, uh, they are compatible they can be uh, they are not an alternative they can, one can side the other and they are usually used together how what what does it mean that an algorithm uh, embed values I'll give you an example. Till 10, 15, 20 years ago, you need a loan. You go to your bank manager. You speak with the manager. The manager knows you. Uh, he, she says, she knows that you are a reliable person or you're not reliable. And the bank manager make a decision whether to give you a loan or not. Normal life. Today, bank managers are completely powerless. They do not make any decision in practice. And most bank loans are must be requested by going on the website of the bank, answering a series of questions, and then you get a credit score, a credit rate, which is at the end is yes, we can give you this loan or no, we will not give you the loan or we can give you just, just a loan till this amount of money not, not be over. How algorithms make such a decision? They analyze a series of risk factors or variables. But how many variables are in human life? Thousands, millions. So you decide the relevant value, the relevant variables. So let's imagine, let's suppose an algorithm that use among variables, the money you spent your, with your credit card in a nightclub. And this lower your credit score. If you gift, make a lot of donation, donate money to a charity, this increase your credit score. A stupid example. But this is an example how you could embed values in algorithms. I can decide, and, and, and the example I did, this is a, it is an approach which is based on the idea that a, a trustworthy bank uh, uh, customer is someone who does not uh, spend his money with belly dancer drinking champagne, while it is a benevolent person who gives money to charities. This is an ethical approach. You can imagine a Nazi society in which they use as variables how many Jews you killed. And this increase your credit score. This is the way in which designer include embed in algorithms their biases. Then you know that the algorithms are today more and more written by other algorithms that through the machine learning application. So at a certain moment, you, you lose control of this system. You, you have started with belly dancer and you, you cannot imagine where at the end, the final algorithm will consider important variables. But as a matter of fact, the way in which the algorithm works will determine, will decide about your bank loan or about uh, uh, your uh, uh, 
right to cross borders, to immigrate, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, okay. Okay. Sometimes designers are unaware. They design their algorithms and they do not perceive that they are including in the algorithm their ethical perspectives. Other times, designers are aware and uh, it is uh, they are following a policy of their company or their government. I this is a, a, a real life example. Some three, four months ago, I, I don't remember exactly, but this year, at a certain moment, if you searched on Google, who entered first in the Auschwitz extermination camp, saving the prisoners? What army freed? Prisoners from Auschwitz. Was the Red Army? Started. They say, you know, now Google gives you the answer. Also, not only the, the, the where do you can you can find answers, but always also the answer, the possible answer. And the answer was is a controversial issue. Why controversial? Because we are in war against Russia. <laughs> and what does it mean? It means that the way in which algorithm, Google search engine algorithm are created, are designed, determine what kind of information will be extracted. And in such a case, in such an example, something which was completely out of discussion became a controversial issue. They don't, they don't make uh, any false statement. Probably there are some uh, website, critical website, who has a very high score for Google, which reported the news, the, the, the information that the Auschwitz was not uh, freed, was not uh, uh, was not the, the Red Army to enter first in Auschwitz. And Google, using this piece of information, produced a false information. But you don't know one of the most, uh, you know that one of the most uh, secret things in this world are Google algorithms. They are commercial secrecy. So we don't know how this has been produced. Whether designers, engineers are aware of the biases embedded in their algorithm, or they are not aware, in any case, which is relevant, that users are not. I've never seen in my life, maybe there is, but I've never seen in my life a website or a software which have a disclaimer at the beginning, this software or this website or this uh, search engine has been created on the basis of the following ethical perspective. We think that belly dancers are the evil and charities are angels. No, I've never seen this kind of disclaimer. And users, as a matter of fact, and we all, when we are users, 
assume that the system is neutral, that the system has no ethical point of view. Typical example which concern biometrics and face recognition technology is uh, the rate of false positive and false negative that can be higher or low, lower in different according to different groups. Gender, ethnicity, age, but many, many examples. Basically, the standard biometrics technology is uh, uh, standardized on uh, white middle-aged men. Anything which is uh, outlier from this uh, standard can have different uh, for acceptance and uh, rejection rate. Can be a very serious problem uh, if you are if you have a, uh, if you use a, a face recognition to detect criminal offenses and to report to the police the offender. If the system has a, a higher false acceptance rate, which affect people, colored people. The risk is that most colored people are uh, accused of criminal offense than white people. A white person has more probabilities to escape identification. So this is a typical example. And there are many studies which confirm that this is the reality. Usually, women, senior people, and colored people uh, are detected in a less accurate way by face recognition. And this is, depends on the way in which algorithms have been written or have been trained, as I, I explain you later on. The approach, which is called uh, disclosive ethics, is uh, fundamentally the analysis of algorithms to detect this kind of biases. So the idea behind disclosive ethics is we don't need to observe the application working in real life. It is enough that Algorithms are analyzed by experts who uh, try to identify biases within the algorithm themselves. The other approach is value-sensitive value design, which says, okay, it makes sense to analyze algorithms to find biases, but it makes even more sense that uh, engineers from the beginning start thinking some good values include in their systems. Again, be cautious. Because when we say engineers embed in the system, good values, we assume that we are in agreement about good values. Remember the, 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 the example I gave you. It is good to kill Jewish people. It is bad to save them. Nazi regime. So if the only, the, the only criteria I use is that engineers should embed good values, and Nazi engineers include your algorithm, as a, 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 to give you a higher score to get a loan from the bank, killing people. So it should be should find a common basis, but to find a common basis is not easy in a society in which there are many points of view. Hmm? So 
We, we can agree that killing people is bad, generally speaking, because killing people in war seems to be very laudable. So it is enough that two states declare war, start a war, and something which was completely unacceptable till the day before becomes totally acceptable. Not, not only acceptable, because it becomes heroism. You are a hero because you killed the enemy. By the way, some century ago, in uh, less than a century ago, in some uh, Amazonic tribes, beheading your enemy and then smoking their heads and collecting them at home was a very laudable virtuous initiative and you are you were deplorable if you did not so if you did not kill your enemies and smoke in their heads i guess that today in most countries heading beheading uh, enemies and smoking their heads would be considered a bit deplorable. So, value-sensitive design is a very intelligent, very clever approach, but has this big problem behind who decides what are the values to be embedded. And by the way, even if we reach an agreement about what values must be embedded, there is always the problem of uh, unconscious biases. Think of a team, designer team, engineer team, made up only by men, all male team or all female team with the same religion, with the same philosophical perspective on life. Think of a, a team of engineers who are all vegetarians. And they think that killing animals and eating them is something very horrible. It is, it is the bad. It is not only bad, it is the bad. Totally acceptable point of view. But are you sure that they are not including, not being aware huh? in, in an unconscious way, their point of view in their algorithm? Maybe if you are a bachelor, your bank, your credit score will be a bit lower than if you are a farmer. Of course, you, you can try to alleviate, to mitigate this problem, making, creating uh, pluralistic engineering teams. So putting people from different nationalities, different religions, different gender, etc. But not always possible, and it is not a guarantee. A guarantee. Another approach is you can educate engineers, which is one of the most stupid things and most offensive things I can imagine because you are adult people and I should educate you. But I give you some lesson on what is ethics. At the end of the day, is anyone who will change his point of view about what is good and what is bad because of my lesson on ethics? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so, frankly. Education in this field is rather un unuseful, it's not something which produces any result. There are two approaches which makes more sense, makes more sense. One is participatory design, which is to involve, it is a technique which is very established, well-established technique of design, uh, 
involved uh, stakeholders and civil society in the design phase of a software, of an algorithm, and so on. It is not a guarantee again, but it is just more substantial. And then, in any case, in particular today, that algorithms are created by previous algorithms, which were created by other algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. So engineers have lost control of their final result, which is important, is a, a, a continuous auditing of algorithms. Should be, algorithm should be ethically auditable evaluated, assessed by external expert. Then there is another issue, as I told you uh, previously. Ethical design is the core, but beyond ethical design, there is the problem of data quality. Because it, it, algorithms can be bias-free theoretically, but if data are not bias-free, if you provide train algorithm with biased data, again, the result will be biased. If you provide an algorithm to recognize criminal faces with a sample, made by people jailed in USA jails. You know that each three white men, each three black men, there is one white man jailed, not because they, they commit less crime, but because the system is uh, in such a way. So, so black people are most easily targeted than white people. But if you take if you take your sample of criminals to train an algorithm from American jails, data are biased. Because it is biased the sample you used. So this is expressed by the criteria of veracity, which include many other things. But the, the idea is uh, if the sample is biased, data are not trustworthy. Then data are integrated. You combine different sources. The way in which it is data, data are, uh, is integrated is again and produce biases. And uh, information extract, extraction, the way in which information is extracted and presented to uh, the algorithm to train it, again, can select some pieces of information and produce biases. Finally, there is a, a big practical problem, which concerns, I told you that one solution is an auditable algorithm. A big problem is that if algorithms are protected by commercial secrets like Google, how can you audit them? It is impossible. You imagine that in 2017, the American Machine Computer Association Policy Committee suggested that all non-intelligible and non-transparent algorithms should be prohibited by law. Because if an algorithm is not intelligible by external expert, cannot be used to make any decision concerning human beings. And this is not a proposal made by crazy European member of the European Parliament, but it is a proposal made by the American Machine Computing Association.
So, today it remains that ethical continuous regular ethical assessment of algorithms is the best solution we have found. But you see, it is not the perfect solution. There are still many problems that should be solved. Okay, let me conclude. And I conclude with uh, two observations and uh, uh, one final thought and comment. The first observation, we started with uh, the European Commission, the European Parliament, which banned or at least proposed to ban a series of technologies based on artificial intelligence, which mostly concern face recognition technology. Uh, there are some reasons behind, uh, I don't like ban in general. Uh, as you could understand. But I understand, I realize that there are some reasons behind. Because today, a lot of decisions are entrusted on mechanical devices. And this is more and more and more and more and more. I give you the example of the bank manager who has no power today in practice. Uh, but also medical doctors have less and less power to make any decision in their practice. Mm. Lawyer, so. And the more the time go by, goes by, the more uh, we, we go ahead and the more probably uh, human activities will be substituted, most human activity will be substituted by uh, algorithm, teaching, even teaching. And uh, the COVID pandemic has been a, a strong driver in this sense, because the increasing the digitalization of our society has pushed toward a, a, an automatization of a lot of professional activities. But it is, this is my second observation. And my second observation is the main message I would like to convey you. This is possible to replace human beings with artificial intelligence only because human beings already imitate artificial intelligence. We are used to think that machines are parroting human beings. False. We invent machines for doing a lot of important things. Then what happened in society is that human beings start parroting machines. The ideal of human beings is to work like a machine. So they don't, don't use any longer the human skills. They follow flow charts, they follow guidelines. At a certain moment, if a medical doctor only follows guidelines, if an engineer always uh, only follows guidelines, can be substituted very easily with a mechanical device, which works better 
He said, if this is the way of working, I would prefer a mechanical devices than human beings because the mechanical devices is more reliable than human beings. Humans can save themselves only if they use the added value they have. And the added value is that logic is broader than machine logic. Rational understanding of the world is broader of machine understanding. But to do this, humans must become again humans. It means that they have to accept their responsibilities. The main reason why people obey guidelines, flowcharts, etc., etc., is not to be accountable. Because in the moment you say, I follow guidelines, I follow guidelines becomes the law. Huh? I follow the law. I follow the rules established by the ministry. I follow the law, the law established by, by the World Health Organization. But did you keep are you aware that you killed a lot of people? Ah, I don't care. I follow it. The rules established by the World Health Organization. What is the problem? But this is the same reasoning of uh, made the examination camp. Well, say, they say, come on, we follow the, the rules. The rules were legal. What is the problem? The, the problem probably is Hitler. But, the only, the only guilty is Hitler. We are all innocent people because we follow the rules. <laughs> this, this seems to be extreme. It is not extreme. It is the reality. But the reality is that human have an added value. But this added value implies some responsibilities. And Otherwise, this is the final result. And as you see, you don't need any longer human beings. Machines are perfect. So you can imagine a society which everyone, where everyone get uh, uh, some little money to survive and to purchase iPhones, uh, because we need to have money to purchase iPhones. Uh, but when we get the money to purchase iPhones, okay, now don't disturb. The important things are decided by algorithms and by mechanical devices. You are a consumer, that's it. So what is the broader logic? How can it be cultivated and developed? This would require a new lecture. So I can't start answering this question, but just I would like just to give you some clues. Imagine that what are algorithms, what are mechanical devices, computer machines, et cetera, are computing devices. So they are measuring basically all mechanical intelligence, even the more refined, the more advanced, is still a computing machine. It means a machine which is based on measuring of quantifying the world, which is extremely helpful. The, the Western society has developed its technology thanks to quantification. But now forget your big engineers. 
think of yourself as human beings, how many things in your life, among the most important ones, can be quantified? Can the sea be quantified? Can the sun, can the pleasure eating a good dinner or speaking to a friend can be quantified? Can, can you can measure this? So this is the world which escape from machine. Machine cannot deal with this world, cannot be quantified. Of course, you can try to quantify with emotion detection, which is one of the most ridiculous things I've never heard. So the final thought, the final thought is very easy. I would like to thank you because probably you could do most interesting and funny things than staying here, but you were obliged by the evil Professor Testarelli. So it is not <laughs> your virtue, but it is a Professor Testarelli benevolence. But in any case, I thank you for your attention and for your tolerance about this speech, which, is not, which was not about uh, the standard biometric uh, issues. Thank you very much, uh, Emilio. As always, uh, you allowed us to have a different view. So any questions? Eric, I checked on GPT. The Soviet army is still, uh, you know, entering in the camps. So I mean, so far we are ready. <laughs> there is no. I just checked. Hey. <laughs> you told <saw> everything. <laughs> No, the, 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 it is, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the issue is always uh, economy and money, the driver. Uh, the idea, we have had our society lives. Uh, through a continuous reset. There are some economical hypotheses, they do not work. And all governments, all big companies reset the scenario. So till a few years ago, the idea was globalization in a broader sense. So unique culture, unique point of view of life, etc., etc. Then this uh, turned out to be impossible or not to be economical advantages, basically because the idea was that Asia could remain the place of industrial production and the West could be the world of the consumers which is not what happened. China is not only a place which is producing products, but is always also an economical power. This obliged the West to break globalization in the previous sense, but the West at the beginning of, uh, at the end of last century, only on six, five thousand, four, four thousand, uh, four, four billions of inhabitants of the planet, about two were living in Western countries. Today, on six, seven, eight billion, I don't remember how many, but there are only two always living in the West. It means that the West is a minority. 
But the end of globalization means that the West cannot import immigrants any longer. The new out uh, source industrial works in Asia. And how can you survive economically speaking? Easy. You put machine doing the job of human beings. The Western strategy in this very moment, after the big reset, huh, is that most human labor should be performed by machines. And the intelligence, artificial intelligence, is the enabling technology to create this new economic scenario. It's going to, to, to end in such a way, no. <laughs> Probably there will be another reset in the next 10 years. But this is the way in which our society is progressing. They, they dream and they are not able to, to realize what they dream. Or regressing. Or regress, or regress. But it depends also on you, eh? because the way in which you will do your job as an engineer is more critical than you can imagine. You are really in a critical, in a crux point of the evolution of our society. Other comments, questions? If not, thank you again, Emilio. And this is just a small sign of appreciation. Wow. <laughs> okay, so we I think we finished we we finished the